Welcome, everyone. I've got everybody muted. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and drop them into the chat. And uh, at the end, we'll have quote and answer, and I'll probably unmute people at that point in time. Shmuel, take it away. Cool. So hi, everyone, again. I, just, I was just telling you that Americans don't know that, but in Europe, we have something that's called the Eurovision. And this is a song competition that every year, all the countries send a song. It's something very stupid, I must say, very stupid. But there's a part when they need to say hi to all the countries. And I feel like we're in the Eurovision. Hi, Canada. Hi, Sweden. Hi, Ireland. Like, that's very, very cool. And I'm very happy you joined here. And I want, uh, uh, just because we have guests from Australia, if you're from Australia, wave your hand so I can see you. And something very cool about this day for me. If you are in Australia right now, the date is December 18, correct? Here in Israel, Europe and the States is still the 17th. So only people in Australia can wish me a happy birthday. Happy birthday, 18 of December. What are the odds? Celebrating only in Australia. Okay, um, first thing, tonight is the last night of Hanukkah. And I think it's only suits that you're gonna join me in lighting candles, okay, shall we? We're good, yeah? Thumbs up. Absolutely, yes, thumbs up. Light candles. Live from Israel, from Samaria, eighth day of Hanukkah, it's happening. So Shmuel, do you say a special first, prayer as you're lighting the candles? I'll explain everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do okay, it actually. Go for it. That's my ninth lightning because my kids did it before and I waited to do it with you guys. So I'm actually lighting now and I'm doing it the way I should do it, okay? This is not a performance. That's the real thing. And so... This is real light, I'm not a magician. Very important, if the room is gonna light on fire, let me know, okay? Because I can't see behind me. Okay. Hey, Shmuel, take your screen off so that we can see you big. What do you mean? Um, stop screen sharing so that we can see you. Cause like we can barely see you. All we can see is a little picture. So just stop screen sharing, there you go. And then I will make it where you are big maybe spotlight video there now we can see you i'm sorry okay so now it's much better i'm gonna light yes. the candles now okay אלוהינו מלך העולם, שעשה ניסים לאבותינו בימים ההם, בזמן הזה. הנרות הללו אנו מדליקים, הנרות הללו אנו מדליקים על הניסים, ועל הנפלאות, ועל התשועות, ועל המלחמות, שעשית לאבותינו. שעשית לאבותינו בימים ההם, בימים ההם, בימים ההם, בזמן הזה. מה עוז צו ישועתי, וחנה ארש הבאה, תיקון ותפילתי. ושם תודה מדבר, ותכין מטבח, מצרם נבח, אז אגמור בשיר מזמור, חנוכת המזבח, אז אגמור בשיר מזמור. Hanukkah 
There you go. Amen. <laughs> Eight lights of Hanukkah. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy that you're here. And I am very happy that you just shared this moment with me. The eighth night of Hanukkah is the big night, is the main event. Actually, it's being called Zot Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah. Um, what I just did, I, 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 I did two blessings. One is for lighting the Hanukkah. And the second is Alanisim, which is on the miracles. Literally meaning, Alanisim v'niflaot sh'asita l'avotenu v'yamim ha'em b'zman hazeh. Oh, for, thank you for the miracles that you did to our fathers in their time, in these days. So the same days, but only in the past. And then we sang two songs, Anerot Alalu Shanu Matikim, basically saying that these lights that we light to commemorate the miracles, we have no rights to use them. It's only to see them, to enjoy them, to say thank you for all the miracles and all the things you did to us in Hanukkah. And then we sang Maos Tzu, which is an ancient song that in five, um, courses, we tell the story of, of uh, the Jewish nation in very, very, very short. And Maos Tzu, I recommend you Google this up. I can send you if you want this song. Very interesting. And we, I'm very happy. We have so many guests around from all around the world and I can see so many familiar faces and some faces that are not familiar, but I wanna thank you all for coming. And today what I want to do is to share um, the story of Hanukkah, but not a historical story, but more the essence of what this holiday means, at least for me. Um, so my name is Shmuel, and if you know me, you know that I've been around CFOAC for three years. If you don't know me yet, it's a problem, because I should have known you already, and you should know me. And, and I hope it's only the beginning, and we can get familiar from now. But I work in CFOIC and I used to travel a lot to the States to give talks and to meet people. I don't know if you remember the concept of flights, traveling, something from the past. I hope that one day we're gonna go back to this and it's gonna happen soon. But as for the last year, I've been here and living in Sufim, in Samaria with my four kids. And it was quite a challenging time. I'm sure everybody uh, know what I'm talking about, but here in Israel, um, the lockdowns were really strict and we didn't have school and we were together with our four kids, which was a blessing, but sometimes a bit hard. And um, what can I tell you? This is where we stand right now, uh, that we hope and we pray that um, the la last night of Hanukkah will be the last holiday that we're gonna celebrate under the laws of, of the COVID. And we're gonna go back to what was supposed to be normal life as we know it. So- Well, quick question for you. So sure. one of the things, so tell us about your, your Hanukkah, Hanukkah menorah, because you didn't use a candle to light it. You didn't use the center candle. Right. So, because it's so not a candle. One, is that my Hanukkah, if you go, if you live in an area with some Jews, wherever you are, you're gonna go in the times of Hanukkah to your supermarket and you're gonna find nice candles to light the candle. I actually used olive oil. So ah. this, is, this is for people who don't wanna work so hard. So they <laughs> put it together inside a cup already, olive oil, and you know, I know how you call it, but the thing to, to light it, and the wick. If you noticed, every time my 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 fire burned down, 
I had to light it from the left candle. The left candle is not part of the eight. It is the shamash. The shamash is being used to light the others. As we said, we cannot, we're not allowed to use those candles. So even if the candle I'm lighting with turned off, I had to go back to the shamash and use it. That's the actual candle that I can use. So yeah, it's a good point that we are trying to um, to, to, to do this mitzvah of lighting the nerot, uh, perform this deed uh, like they did it in the time of the temple. Right? There you are. Yep, we can see it. Cool. Okay. Let's jump right in. And the theme, as I said, is Hanukkah, the way I see it, or the way the holiday is supposed to be shown. And, and it starts with this. Let's go through the very, very basic, basic Hanukkah 101. And that is a story that I hope all of you heard at one point. So there was the time of, of, of the, the Greek emperor Antiochus who came to Israel and like every other country that he came, he asked that the people are going to follow his traditional rules, but not to actually die or be killed, you are okay to stay the way you are, but you need to follow the rules and the culture the way I want you to follow. My education, my contribution to the, to the, the way you live your life is by you adapting to my rules, to my rituals. And we know that in every country that they arrived, the influence was very strong and they were really able to adopt to the culture. But when they came to Israel, obviously there was one family, one family because the vast majority of the people adopted. But one family, the family of Matifiao and his children said, we want something different. And although it was insane to believe that they can fight such a huge army and huge emperor, a small family with some people that gather and join them, fought for a couple of months, 18, two years, and fought some great battles against this war and won in different places around uh, Judea and Samaria, not far from Ofra and Shiloh, and not far from Modin, outside of Yerushalayim. Those were the area. So you had some fighting, and that's the big story, that small numbers, not equipped with all the tools, with all the knowledge, with all the power that the Greeks brought to the world, to the Romans, and they were able to survive for a couple of months, for a couple of wars, and it was, wow, what are the odds? Then in one segment of the story, and, and this is where we are connected to what we just did, there's a small miracle because at that time, as the temple still all zone, uh, we're able to um, go inside the temple after it was taken over by them, after they put Zeus in, uh, in, a, in a, a, a sculpture inside, inside the temple, we were able to come inside and to pure it and to go back to do some rituals in the temple. And there was the menorah, the menorah where you light the candles every day and every night in the temple. And they went inside and they were looking for olive oil to use and all of them were unpured. And this is where we go back to, this is like the kindergarten memory of my childhood. They were looking for a little bit of oil and they found this small vessel of oil and it wasn't barely enough for one day. And look, it was good eventually for eight days. For eight days, they were able to light the menorah inside the temple and until they were able to go and make new olive oil to press it down and 
when fresh olive oil came back, story ended and they continued for a couple of months because afterwards the destruction came and it was the end of the story. But for two years, this family, the Chasmonaim, the Maccabees were able to hold off the great, great army that everybody said, there's no odds. And we were able to do it against all odds. A couple of customs of the day, is to light the candles, right? Another custom is that one of the decrees that the degree that we had that that we had against us is not to learn Torah, learn Bible, learn Judaism. So the kids had to hide away when they did it, and when one of the soldiers came to find them, they would take out a dreidel and they would spin it. Right? That's the that's the, 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 the meaning of the big dreidel we all know, the spinning tops. Okay, in, your, in this photo you can see again some of the numbers, eight days and, and four sides of the dreidel. And what else? Oh, we eat some things boiled in, uh, in, in oil. And jelly donuts is Israeli favorite. And also a latke, a leviva, which is potato, uh, fried. It's good. It's nice. Also, again, connected to the story of the oil. You can see the theme, right? What else? Oh, in the photo, you can see the shamash. I, I have another screen, so I point here, but you see it over there. Uh, um, you see the shamash where you light the menorah from. What else there is? Oh, some presents. There's no holiday without presents, right? And if, you know, everybody in town celebrates Christmas and you're the only Jew in town, like Adam Sander said, you say, at least I have eight crazy nights and what, one night of, of presents. That's, that's, the, that's the big the themes of the holiday, generally saying. Are you with me? Yeah? Some yeah, movement? yeah. Yeah, you froze for half a second, but I think you're good. Sure. So I wanted to start and, and, and go deep into the story because I hope all of you heard of the story more or less, right? Raise your hand if you never heard the story. If you never heard the story. I don't see any head, right? That's, that's the obvious. Okay. But I want to ask you, to go and think of an insight about the story. So we know there's actually two elements to the miracle. There's the miracle of the war, few against many. And now we know that there's the miracle of the light of the oil. Which one is more important? Which one is more crucial? If you would be a part of the committee that's gonna, you know, make the traditions to celebrate this holiday. What is the story you want to emphasize in the story of Hanukkah? A story about oil that was good enough for eight days or a story about a few that were able to fight against a big enemy, big army, and were able to win it for a while. I think it's simple to say, right? The war is the big deal. <laughs> Who cares about the oil? Oh, no, 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 no. The, the war. Of course, the war fighting and being able to free our land, our temple for a while. That's the big deal. <laughs> a couple, couple of lives that were, were on for eight days. Is it what? Hold yeah. on, Shmuel. You're gonna have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So why is that? That we emphasize on the miracle of the oil, of the light, and not emphasize on the miracle of the war. It is something doesn't add up more than that. I'm gonna tell you that I spent many years learning uh, what you call. Um, um, advanced biblical studies 
or the Talmud. And in the Talmud, there's one of the biggest question about Hanukkah, actually. It's called Kushiyat Bet Yosef, the Bet Yosef question. The Bet Yosef is one of the biggest rabbis who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, the, the, the Alakhikli book that is used by everyone. And he asked a simple and yet sophisticated question, and I want you to hear it very well. That it's radical. He asked this. You hear the lot of uh, voice, noise. Yeah, I'm gonna mute all again, Shmuel, and then you can unmute yourself real quick. Unmute yourself, Shmuel. The Bet Yosef asks a question as follows. He says, okay, so you found a vessel of oil, I hear you, and you went to the menorah and you had to light it. Of course, it, when they light it, they didn't light one candle, they light all of the menorah, correct? Right. And the question is as follows, listen well. You found a vessel, you add oil for one night. Therefore, even if it was good enough for eight nights, the first night wasn't a miracle. You add enough oil to light the first night. Therefore, the holiday needs to be celebrated for seven days because for seven days, mm. you add a miracle, more oil, the first night when you found it, it was supposed to be good enough for one night. Therefore, you need to celebrate seven days and not eight days. Good question. Yeah. There are books online and in the library near your home that contains more than 300 answers to this question. This is why it's such a famous wow. question, because it's such a basic question about the essence of the holiday, not eight days, but seven days. And every scholar and every rabbi gave an answer of his own. Kim, if you could, somebody's gonna raise his hand and he's gonna try to give his answer why they need to celebrate Eight nights and not seven nights. Somebody has an idea. That's yeah, they can open... chat or that they can uh, unmute themselves as well. Right. If you have an answer, please unmute yourself and share it with the crowd. Come on, who's brave enough? <laughs> it's Hanukkah. Uh... Why, why eight nights instead of seven nights? Uh, is it because the eighth night is the... Wait, wait, wait. Kim, 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 it's not fair. You're is part it... of the staff. I might share this answer with you. Let somebody you from might. the crowd... Here, here, somebody oh. raises his hand. Give it. Go for it. Go for it. Without is the... It because... Sorry. Both of you start, the lady. Without the first night there would have been no seven nights. Okay, I'll answer so that, that makes later. Sense. More, yeah. more, more. Who else? Go ahead, Keith. That's exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> more answer. There wouldn't have been the seven nights without the first night. I would like to ask, was it something to do with the war story and not the oil story? Mm. Two out of 300. Good. More? <laughs> so I would say that it's probably because the candles continued to flicker for eight nights instead of seven. It was eight <laughs> nights to dedicate the temple. Yeah. Well, I've got some I've got some that have written in to Shmuel. Let's see. The fact Jean says the fact that they were in the temple to find the oil was a miracle. And Crystal says because that was how many nights the single pox shaman actually burned while they went to go get more kosher oil to burn. 
and it takes okay. eight days to make the oil. Okay, 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 okay. Very good, guys. The, the 300 answers actually are divided into three, okay? Three categories. I'll summarize them very quickly for you. One is like you said, the first night, the first candle is to commemorate something else altogether. One mm -hmm. is to be actually finding the oil, big celebration. Then seven days, it was light on, so we're celebrating eight days. Second could be the actual winning of the war. That's another night to celebrate. Many, many answers. The second category is that um, the actual celebration is for something different altogether. For example, why eight? When, I when, when you tell a Jew eight days and not seven immediately, there's one thing that comes in mind. Brit Mila. Brit, circumcisions. Oh. It happens also at the eighth day. So maybe according to some of the rabbis, because one of the decrees was not to perform circumcision, there was eight nights to remind you how crucial it is. Interesting. Yeah. And the third category, which is the most, I would say, um, creative one, is that you get it all wrong together. <laughs> From the first day, there was a miracle. Why? Because they found this much oil, right? They didn't spend it in one night. They just put very, very, very little amount at the first day as well. And it was good for the whole night. Oh, now there's a miracle. And then in the next night, another one eighth of the oil. Okay? Or that it was full of oil every night. But they light it. And when they came back in the morning, it didn't drop. So from the first night, you have a miracle. The oil was good, the same level at the first night and the eighth night. Or that they took the vessel and they poured down the oil, but the vessel was full again. So from the first night, you have a miracle. Therefore, 300 answers why you should celebrate eight nights and not seven nights. But today, and that's where I want to jump in, I want to share with you my answer. The 301 answer, if you wish. And it says as follows. It says, you know why a miracle happened? Because think about it. You're in a war and you find a small vessel of oil. You know for a fact you don't have any more kosher oil to light tomorrow. You know what most people would do in that case? They would drop it altogether. They would say, who cares? If tomorrow I don't have enough oil, if the next day I don't have enough, why even bother? Why even try? You know what was the miracle of Hanukkah? Fighting few against many is one amazing thing. But believing that you're going to use the oil today and tomorrow something amazing is going to happen, a miracle that's going to come true, that's the deep insight of Hanukkah. Believing that even against all odds, there's a chance for redemption when it's the darkest, when you don't have any hope, when you literally see the end of everything. You came inside the temple, it's all burned, it's all ruined. You find nothing, you find small vessel of oil and you still have hope. 
you still believe that against all odds, you will be able to light tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And for me, I must tell you that this insight about Hanukkah is not by mistake because Hanukkah is a holiday that almost every Jew celebrates around the world because it gives you the hope that you can make sure that tomorrow is going to bring you light to the future. There's hope that tomorrow is going to bring something better. And even when there's a, you're against all odds, there's a chance, there's a chance that something good is going to happen for me. And I, it was written in the, in, in the preview to this conversation that I'm going to share insights from being an IDF soldier. And, I, and it's funny, right? Because I'm not a big general. Yeah, you, I served like every Israeli for three years. And I did some nice operation all around the area. But I'm not a general. I cannot share with you how we were able to conquer Egypt. It didn't happen. <laughs> but I can share with you a very deep insight about the fact that every Israeli goes to the army. In Israel, they don't ask you whether you want to go or not. It's mandatory. You need to go and serve your nation for three years, whether you want or not, whether you're capable or not, whether you were born for that or not. And when you're there, and you understand that you are part of the chain, and this is your part, your time, to do everything you can to secure your nation, this is where everything clicks. And you understand that you are the small light that is going to shine and is gonna make sure that tomorrow is going to come. And I wanted to show you, for me, it's always amazing. This is Israel. Nothing, small light, nothing, small vessel, very small. And Israel had many, many, many situations <coughs> fighting against all odds. We don't have much time and we wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna go very quickly, two minutes each episode Miftsa Moked the fact that we are able to erase all the airplanes in all the region at the minute the war starts was a defining moment against all odds and Tebi you all remember that an Israeli airplane is being kidnapped and is being taken to Africa to a place which is so far from any friends and any allies. Right. Operation led by <coughs> our friend Yoni Netanyahu, the brother of our Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who lost his life in the operation. Can you imagine the fact that when those people sat in the airport in Uganda, it was against every single possibility or odd that something is might going to save them. What are the odds? But we are playing differently we are playing against the odds. We are able to perform things that nobody would ever consider to perform just because. Google this, please, or ask me, mail me later, and I'm gonna send you about it. Avigdo Kalani and Tzvika, two insane tank commanders 
in the Yom Kippur War. I'm gonna take a second to share with you what happened to Tzvika. Tzvika came from home, he was on vacation, and it was the 73. You see here, we're talking about the Syria border. He goes to a camp called Machane Nafach, and he doesn't have any people in his group. It's him, only him. He takes a tank that came out of repair. He takes two people. He goes to the commander and he says, I want to do something. What can I do? He tells them, you know, there's a point over there. We feel that they might arrive from there. He goes in another tank to a point on the border. And this is the way he describes. He says, it's me and my other friend. And the commander says to me, you know, we need to call you in the devices, how you want to call you, yourself. He says, I don't know. What's your name? My name is Tzvika. Okay, you're going to be the Tzvika force. Now you understand when you call somebody a Tzvika force, you imagine 30, 40, 50 tanks, not a tank and a half. Okay, they're driving to that point. On the way, they get it. He's able to jump out of his tank to move to the other tank. And this is what he describes. He goes to a point, it's like on a mountain, next to a valley. He goes and he sees in front of him hundreds of tanks. He is by himself on his tank and he sees in front of him, he describes hundreds of tanks. He goes, he calls the commander and says, listen, we have a problem here. Please send someone to help me. He says, I have no one to send you. It's going to take between four to seven hours and we're going to send wh whoever we can. Tzvika, by himself, does this. He says, this is the cliff. This is me as a tank. He goes to one side of the hill, shoots one. He goes back. Then he comes from the other side and shoots another one. Goes back to this side and shoot one missile, goes to the other side. For three or four hours, one tank was able to stop numbers that we're talking about, hundreds of tanks. In the morning, he had a couple of tanks that came and helped him. Because of him, all the Syrian tanks were able to move around and go to the other side and retreat. Svika Greenwald, remember this name. And now, I hope we don't have any um, agents here from different countries. I'm going to share with you only knowledge uh, which is known, and it was known, and it was in the media all over the place. You know this guy? Three weeks ago, if you know how to read his, his name, you already have a big advantage over me because I don't know how to read his name. His name is Muhsan Fakizadida, Fakizida. I don't know, okay? But I can tell you this. This guy is the father, the mother, the grandfather of the Iranian nuclear force. This guy, I'm, I'm here, but it's here, right? There's another screen. This guy is in charge of all the system of developing the nuclear power of Iran. Now, as we have a lot of American friends here, you already know and I know that there are going to be a shift in the government soon, who knows? And there is a big difference between what your previous president thought and the coming president thinks about Iran. We're talking about the negotiation, the agreements, the cancellation, you know all of this. Israel understands that salvation is not gonna come from peace and conversation, especially not the future one. We need to stop the person who literally says, we are making a bomb to shoot you and destroy you in Israel. Now, I really need to finish.
but I'm gonna send it to you. You know what? No, I must show it, I must show it. Sorry. One minute. Iranian journalist Mohammad Awaz claims to have received leaked information from the country's government about the assassination of Iran's leading nuclear scientist on Friday. Awaz says the attack was carried out by 12 gunmen who were supported by a team of 50 operatives providing them with information and logistics. He says the hit squad knew Mohsen Fakhirazadeh's security convoy was on its way to his holiday home and were waiting in ambush at a traffic circle marking the entrance to the town of Asbard. As the convoy entered the traffic circle, a car bomb exploded, hitting the rear security car. The 12 attackers then opened fire on the middle car with machine guns and two sniper rifles. According to Awaz, one of the attackers then dragged the scientist out of his car and executed him. The attackers then disappeared, and so far not one attacker has been caught. The Iranian Fars news agency gave a conflicting report, saying that there were no gunmen and that the attack was done by firing a remote-controlled machine gun mounted on the truck that later exploded. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News. Did you notice something weird in this video? They started by explaining there are 50 people who shot guns there. And then another one describes that there was a machine that shot him. There are some screenshots of the titles in the newspaper. I wanna read some, right? A Ryan scientist killed by remote controlled weapon Top nuclear scientist was assassinated with help of satellite device, Iranian media reports. And then last, heat squads, car bombs, and remote control guns analysis. And then there says three theories and we'll never really know the truth. So I hope you listen well. I can tell you that what I heard was based on somebody that knows something. And I'm going to conclude there. How can you stop somebody who has on him about six bodyguards at all time? He drives in a car which is used to shield something that is equivalent to a tank. He is gathered and surrounded at all time and when one single moment is not by himself, how can you stop this guy? And this is according to the analysis around the world what happened only three weeks ago. We have a problem today. Remember, there's not many people flying and traveling. You cannot go that easily from one place to another. Our boys know how to go to places if you Google Mafkhuk in Dubai a couple of years ago, you might remember how they were caught in camera, some tennis players. Interesting, right? I'll tell you what happened here based on the theory. There wasn't any person in that area, not a single person who controlled this scene. It was all managed worked from distance. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, but I can tell you this. The reason they didn't find any person is because there isn't any person in the area. Everything was surprisingly there and everything was vanished a minute after this happened. Now, maybe it's Israel, maybe it's not. As we speak about Israel, I told you the story, but you need to find your sources to approve if it's Israel or not. I can tell you <laughs> one thing. Against all odds. When you think that you are small, yet you don't have the power, that you don't have the ability, there's something that strength you and says you are able, and this is the miracle of the war. But for us, it's not enough. Because if it's only a war and we are small and there are many, we can take the credit and we can say, this is our might. We are trained, we are strong, we are able. 
You know what's the miracle of the light in the menorah? It's a reminder. Don't forget who performs the miracles. Don't forget where it all comes from. Don't forget that miracles, small and big, mighty or tiny, all come from the same source. And that's the source who took oil and lighted it for you for eight nights. And this is the source of power that against all odds was able to help Israel again and again when they needed in those operations, in Hanukkah, in every holiday you can think. And that's the power of what we have in the chain of generations that makes us strong and celebrate this day. I cannot emphasize enough, but if you heard me in the past, you know that this power, this miracle is what we feel day in and day out when we live in this region of Judea and Samaria. We talk about an Israel update and we talk about Hanukkah and we talk about a miracle, but you know how day in and day out living in this region, living in this area against all odds, all comes from the power of the Almighty and the power of miracle that gives us the power to fight against all odds. That's my Hanukkah, my friends. Please, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I'm here. Um, so I got one online that says, do secular Jews in Israel celebrate Hanukkah? And if so, why? And then once you get done with that, Paul and Joyce Lagno have a question as well. The answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Not only in Israel, even around the world, Hanukkah is being celebrated in more than 90% of the houses. And now you need to ask yourself, why is that? They care about the war. They care about the miracle. They care about God coming to us and showing his power. The truth is, they don't care. But I tell you what they do care about. I think the very essence of Hanukkah, to continue this thought, is the fact that deep down, deep down, I did, inside a lot of unpured oil, there's a small vessel of oil in every person, in every Jew. And that's the inner, inner center of his soul that finds and seeks this connection. And while 357 days of the year, it might be hiding away, but in those days of Hanukkah, something inside of you explores this small vessel of oil. And we believe, we believe that in every person, in every person there's this power inside of him to, to light on. And, and, and we see that. And you're going to walk around Israel and you will see everybody's around it. Everybody works. It's like there's no holiday. But still, you come at night and you light those candles and you eat those jelly donuts and you're part of the tradition. <laughs> In the U.S. as well, wherever you are, it's not important how far you are. You would go to this Walmart and you buy those 20 minutes lighting blue and white candles and you would light it. And maybe you're gonna buy some chocolate coins. That's a tradition as well. <clears throat> Go ahead, Pauline Joyce. So thank you, Shmuel, for the, for your wonderful service. And uh, we missed you in the United States this year. It was great to see you in February. But um, so there's been a miracle for us this year. We we did we're doing all eight days this year because we're. You know, we're inside most of the time. We 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 normally miss a day, you know, because we we uh, are in our busy lives before this year. But this year we did every every day. But just a few days ago, you you know of the Hanukkah miracle at the West Wall. Who would have thought one year ago that there would be Arabs 
at the Western Wall celebrating Hanukkah. It's, it's, it's a miracle. Um, and I would guess that these enemies of Israel, um, like Iran and Lebanon and Syria, they have got to be in fear of what's going on with the Arabs um, that are now supporting Israel. So what is your impression of, of what's going on? It's, is it peace, peace when there is no peace? Or is it going to be a lasting peace? Over. Um, you, I, I, I think you're talking about the um, UIA and Bahrain and Morocco and Sudan and all those countries. And this is where it gets like amazingly crazy. Right? Think about it, Paul. You, you were told always that we are the obstacle for peace. And because of us, right? Because of us, all the nations crumble and they fight and there's this and that because of us. Wow. And how come when there's a chance, when there's an opportunity, everybody jumps and waits in line for an agreement with us? And I think that the Palestinians right now, as we talk, they are very mad and crazy because they felt how it feels when somebody tells you, you know what? They are not the source of the problems. You are the source of the problem. Throughout so many years, we were thought to be the, the, the problem. And now after so many years of refuse, of, of, of scrumbling, we offered, and I said it all the time, the amount of the times we offered the Palestinians everything and they said no, proved the world, the Arab world, the Muslim world, you know what? You are not the bad guys. You are starting to, to realize that we want to live here in our homeland in peace. We don't, we are not against our brothers around us. I wouldn't say brothers, but maybe nephews. But we are from the same family, cousins, right? So we're together. There's not a problem. We can live in neighbors. You know, it's an interesting, I, I just read a very interesting article about the fact that half of the Israelis comes, come from countries like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Yemen, and, and Egypt, Syria. The Sephardim Jews are from there. My grandmother, grandfather were born and raised in Algeria and Tunisia. And we were always neighbors and in good faith and goodwill and there wasn't any issues. So what changed? You know the truth? Nothing changed. But the Palestinians, our neighbors here, when they want to make obstacle for peace and for living normal life in the region, they tried everything and all the countries say to them, we had enough. Why stop peace and, and, and friendship with a country like Israel, which is literally a light in the region, talking about lights, innovation, knowledge, medicine, everything that we can bring to the table brings so much value and the countries understand. So do I think it's real? Yes, I think it's very real. I think for once they thought about themselves before somebody who makes the problem in class and, and you want to tell them, be quiet, you're interrupting everybody. That's my, my thought. A uh, question for you. Um, do you think the peace agreements will last now that President Trump is on his way out of office and with the new, with the new uh, US president? Listen, I. I, I, really, I really want to believe, like I said before, this is their best interest. I think that what they gain from Israel knowledge and Israel, what, what you know, the added value Israel brings to the table to every country we're working with is bigger than anything else, than any other in the individual. Trump was a big pusher to this. And I think he would, you know, need to give him the credit. 
He was always <laughs> preaching that he wants to make deals and he made some amazing yeah. deals. And I think that was the beginning. I feel that what Israel brings to the table, the added value that we can bring to those countries is what's going to make it remain sustainable peace. And, and I can tell you that sometimes I feel like I'm the only person in Israel which doesn't spend the weekends in Dubai. And it's weird because you go <laughs> online and everybody's in Dubai. Like, every Israel is in Dubai right now. Literally, it's an empty country. No, it's only me and my wife. For real. So many people are in I'm Dubai. They enjoy it. Dubai. <laughs> it's crazy that everybody's in Dubai. Um, and they enjoy it. And they, and you know what, and they bring, they bring their money to Dubai and they're going to bring it to Morocco as well. Tourism, one factor, so many factors, so many investments, so many knowledge, so much knowledge, mm. universities, medicine. You know what's crazy? Listen to this. Go online and search wine, Samaria, Dubai. There was a big agreement a week ago that Samaria wine is going to be in the supermarkets in Dubai. What? Sumerian wine in Dubai. Google it and you will find it. I'm telling you, it's amazing. That means the prices are going to go up for us. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sure, sure. <laughs> it's good, it's good. Because, listen, it's a, wow, amazing. All right, now you get to put on your profit hat. Does Israel have any date when they think all the land will be Israel's? In other words, do they expect their battles will be over? <laughs> do we hope for this? The answer is yes. We pray for it. We hope. And we negotiated it in the past. Listen, I don't I don't find that there's a single person in the world that wants to live with his sword or on his sword. I don't know how you say it, but enough, right? But more than that, more than living quiet is that the fact that we need to live. And, and if quiet is not an option, we can do something else. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to continue that. It's insane. But unfortunately, I would quote Golda Meir saying, the war is going to be over when they're going to love their kids more than they ate us. It's true. It's sad. It's sad, but it's so true. And, and you know, going into their educational system to see how they educate their kids against us, that we are monsters. It's like... You know, the other day I was speaking to my kid about, about this education. That, you know, Because I drive through Calcilia and my son is smart. He always asks me, what's our feeling towards them? Like, what do you think about them? And, and I never say something bad. I say, listen, they are good people. Some of them really, really don't like us. Therefore, because I don't know who likes us and who doesn't, you need to keep away. But you need to know that they're not bad people per se. And, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a topic, that's an issue. Unfortunately, I don't see a major change in their education, in, in, in their systems. I find that they, they repeat themselves and they wanna fight and they wanna conquer everything. It's, 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 you know, it's us versus the ocean. They want, they want us in the ocean eventually. And that's something that's not going to pass, at least not on my shift. I want to fight before I'm going to be thrown to the ocean because I'm not a big, such a good swimmer. And that's it. Good. How do uh, Jewish people feel about Christians who celebrate Hanukkah? Um, that it's not fair that you took the easiest day to celebrate. Light <laughs> candles. Let's see you on your poor fast. Let's see you not eat. Leaven bread on Passover. <laughs> you took light candles. Ah. Uh, in general, though, they're not upset by it at all. It's remembering the miracle. For sure. 
I just would like to tell you, Shmuel, a group of uh, we Christians from Canada uh, went to Jerusalem last year for 9th of Av. And we fasted 40, 25 hours, nothing, no water, nothing. And we ended wow. the fast with tea and wow. cake. And we love you. So if we light eight Hanukkah candles, it's okay. We do Purim too. We do that's, it all with you. That's cool. I, I, I appreciate every connection. I appreciate the fact that you are here listening to me for more than an hour. I, wow. I appreciate the fact that there's a dialogue and a conversation. I can tell you that in the Nachala that's gonna be published in a couple of days, Kim, I don't know about the schedule immediately, but for the first time after three years, they thought to interview a settler. So they interviewed me and there's a piece about me and my photo and stuff. And I wrote it and that's a real quote I gave. And I really believe in that for me every time that I engage in a dialogue with, with Christians and, and I hear people saying, we love you, we support you, we care about you. Like every person in this room that ever saw me, heard me saying that, for me, this is a miracle. Nothing less than a miracle. Hanukkah miracle, this is a miracle. The fact that we're engaging together, that there's a conversation, it's, it's, it's insane. We live a prophecy. We live in times that nobody dreamed before that they're gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, Angela, I really appreciate everything. And I really thank you for all of this. And, and it's nothing but a miracle for me, really. Oh, thank you. Because we, we hunger for Israel. We are homesick for Israel. There's something special. I've traveled the world, but Israel is the light. Yeah. And that leads right into the next question, Shmuel, which is what is Israel doing about tourism? Any, any thoughts on when people, when tourists will be allowed to return? Who asked this question? Who asked this? Uh, Joyce Dixon did, Joyce and Charles. From where? Uh, North Carolina. When? People would be, you know, coming to Carolina the way they come like the once before, Israel is going to open as well. And before that, Israel is in a huge crisis because we don't have tourism. And mm. like we, we based on it, there's like 10% of the, our, our national income is in tourism. That's really, really bad. So think of the hotels that are empty, the taxi drivers, the restaurants, the souvenir shops. And I gave you just, just the top. Right. Not talking about the bus drivers and the yeah. tourist guides. Why right. does a tourist The hotel go workers. Work? Like yeah. you, wanna, you wanna do something to help people, send the tourist guide that you liked in the past, send them a tip for the next trip. Honestly, think about the fact that they were out of work for 10 months now and they don't even see where it's going to end, like how bad it is. So tourism is, is, is really bad. We hope that it's going to come soon. And I don't know what you feel about it, but vaccine in Israel is very strong now. In Saturday night, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is going to be the first Israeli to take the vaccine. Now, whether you believe in it or not, I don't care. But when vaccine is going to be on the table, Israel is going to think about opening the gates again. Oh, if you are vaccine, you can come in. No, uh, uh, no, there's going to be games with that. But vaccine is the first step to open. Absolutely. And um, we have a question here. Are there other Arab countries that Israel works with today that may be the next to sign a formal agreement? That's a question for Trump and Bibi, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, definitely the recording will be available and Shmuel's uh, presentation that he had is uh, 
slides. We'll have all of those available. I'll get them sent out probably I tomorrow. One thing. Yeah. Yes. So this is my email and that's my number and that's my name. And that's the CFOIC logo. <laughs> please fill. And, and how do we pronounce it, Shmuel? CFOIC. Shmuel Jungle. No, 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 Shmuel. Shmuel. You, you can call me Sam. It's okay. And, <laughs> and, yeah. and please feel free. Not feel free. I, I, I welcome you. I hope you're going to write uh, to me. And, and, and let's start a uh, conversation. I'm telling you that's a blessing for me and, and that's a blessing for CFOIC. And honestly, the lady on the far left box there, Kim, yeah? Yeah. Me and, and, and Sandra from Israel are doing so much day and night to help the, the organization, help Christians support the people in need of Judea and Samaria. We live in a hard time. A corona strike everybody as well you know you know that already and i really hope that um you're going to continue to support us and and connect with us and and understand that what you're doing is a true blessing to the state of israel to the people of israel to us and we really hope that we're gonna reconnect again either by you coming here or by us visiting you there because enough is enough so from the lights of hanukkah Let's bless the world that it's going to be over the COVID, this madness, and God is going to send a flash of big health to every Amen. person, to all the nations, to all the people, wherever they are. You can say to all together, Amen. 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 Thank you, Shmuel.